Well, good evening. If you would please turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3, and we read beginning with the first verse down to verse 5. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask now, Lord, that you would guide us as we strive to preach your word. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the sufficiency of it, Lord. Father, I think about when Paul left the Ephesian elders, he commended them to you, to your grace, and to your word. And Lord, he trusted and he knew that that was enough for them. And I thank you, Lord, tonight that that your presence in our lives, the presence of your spirit, the reality of your grace, and the sufficiency of your word is enough for your saints. Lord, I pray that tonight you would empower this time of preaching, that you would make it effective, that your people would be edified and instructed. And where we're in need of it this evening, Lord, even corrected. That, Lord, we would walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've called us. And we ask you this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we've been seeing, Paul is in the midst of a defense. It's something under the surface. It's not something... You know, overt. He doesn't come out and say, now I'm defending our ministry. But as you, as you read chapter 2 and chapter 3, it's just apparent that he is, he's taking them back. He's reminding them of his time with them and of the character and the nature of the ministry that he had there because he has been criticized. And he's doing this not for himself. He's doing this ultimately for them. It's not uncommon that the enemies of the gospel, it's not uncommon that the enemy of our souls, the devil, would try to convince God's people that those who have taught them the truth and those who they need to hear at the moment are not really trustworthy. And that's what is going on in Thessalonica. So what does Paul do? Well, he takes them back in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, to the time that he spent there in Thessalonica. He reminds them of the character of his ministry among them. Then in chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, he reminds them of the energy of the Word of God as they first received the Word of God from the apostles, but then the ongoing working of the Word of God in their lives. That is, their own, the, the, the transformation of these people in Thessalonica testifies to the genuineness of his ministry. He says, in effect, not only remember the ministry, look at yourself and look at the effect of God's Word in your life. And there's a testimony about our ministry. And then he, in verses 17 through 20, we looked at this last time, he he begins to explain to them why he hasn't been back to them. Remember what the criticism of Paul is. Paul, why did you leave Thessalonica so quickly? We looked at it in the book of Acts, how there they are ministering in this city, and the Jews stir up strife, and so the brothers get them out of town, you know, to to save their lives. Why did you leave so swiftly and why haven't you returned? I think the criticism of Paul, you know, behind the scenes, under the surface is Paul doesn't really care about you. He doesn't care about you and this is proven by the fact that he left you and this is proven by the fact that he hasn't returned to you. And so what he's doing is he's explaining 
that he does care about them. And in verses 17 through 20, he explains not only why he, the, the nature of his leaving. Remember, he says, we were torn away from you. Uh, it's a word that speaks of being orphaned. He says, it's like we were torn away from our children. So I didn't leave because I wanted to. And in fact, he says, I've tried to come back to you again and again. I've wanted to come to you, he says in verse 18, but Satan hindered us. And he says, if you doubt that we really care about you, just remember this, that in our minds, our future before the Lord Jesus face to face involves you. Verse 19, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. He says, I look forward to standing one day before the Savior with you, his people who've been bought by his blood. And you are in some sense my crown, my victor's crown, because God has in his grace been pleased to use me in some way to gather in this people who were paid for by the blood of Jesus. Now what he does in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, is he explains how even though he's not been able to come to them personally, why he sent Timothy. He explains that he did send Timothy. He explains why he sent Timothy and what he hoped to see accomplished in them as a result of Timothy's presence. If you take all of this together, right, chapter 2, and now we move into chapter 3, if you take all of it together, there's a picture that emerges. And that's what I want us to look at tonight. The, 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 the theme that runs through all of this, and the picture that emerges is this, the love of a shepherd. What it means to love someone in ministry. The true love of a true shepherd. And we not only think about the Apostle Paul, obviously, I mean, I think about my own ministry here. I think about what it means to love God's people in ministry. But you also should think about, wherever you have ministry, what it means to really love people that you minister to. What it looks like to really be a shepherd. What it looks like to really care about the people that you have a ministry to. And tonight I want to point out five marks of a true shepherd's love for his people. And then we'll finish with some examination questions. But five things you see again in verses 1 through 5. Let's read the verses again together and then we'll begin to point these out. Verse 1, Therefore when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this, for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow your, the, the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. Here's the first mark of, of, of a real love for the people you minister to, an intense interest in their spiritual well-being. An intense interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people. That's the mark of a true shepherd. Do you notice how Paul expresses his concern for them in verse 1? He says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer. And he repeats that in verse 5. Look at verse 5. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer. When we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left at Athens alone. We sent Timothy, our brother, verse 5. When I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. Could bear it no longer. The idea being, I couldn't hold out against this desire any longer. I had this intense interest in how you were doing. And I couldn't be patient any longer. And so I sent Timothy. I sent to find out about your faith. 
Now, that, that speaks of someone who really cares about how they're doing, doesn't it? I mean, if I have such an intense interest in how you're doing that I feel like I can't stand it any longer, I've got to know, I've got to find out. It's a genuine interest in your spiritual health. When I thought about this, I, can, I compared it uh, to a natural interest in people you care about. Um, for the parents who have little ones, you'll experience this someday. Eventually, your children grow up to be able to drive. That's a frightening thing. So here you are one evening, and your son, I won't point out which one, but your son says, Dad, I'll be leaving this place at this time, and I should be home around this time. Right? So he gives you a, a launching point and a landing point. You do not go to sleep while your children are not home. I, I'll tell you that. Maybe some of you can. I can't. So you, you're, you're awake. And guess what? Now they're 30 minutes past landing point. And what do you do in this day and age? I don't know how our parents dealt with it because we didn't have cell phones. But what do you do in this day and age? You call. And, of course, what happens? It goes immediately to voicemail. <laughs> so they're not home. They're 30 minutes late. And I can't get a hold of them. What does your mind do? They could have been in a wreck. They could be broken down somewhere where they don't get cell phone signal. Okay, what's the next thing you think? Well, what route do they normally take to come home from this place? And before long, when you feel like you cannot wait any longer, what do you do? You get in your car and you go find out. I have to know to the, to the, to the best of my ability to do it. Maybe even I send someone else. The siblings love this too when they drive. Okay, you get in your car and you go look for your brother. I'll stay here in case he arrives home. Now, of course, when they get home, you were just out of your mind, weren't you? Oh, what were you worried about? Uh, I didn't, I had my phone on vibrate. I didn't hear you call. I mean, all those things happen. Here's the point, though. When you love someone, if you feel like they're in danger, it upsets you. And you can't just sit there in, in peace and rest you have to find out. You have to know. Well, this is how the Apostle Paul felt about these believers in Thessalonica. He, he didn't know how they were doing. He wanted to come to them. He had tried more than once. He, he tells us he's been satanically hindered. He can't get to them himself. We don't know exactly why. He doesn't tell us exactly why. Why he himself cannot go to Thessalonica. But he knows this. When he couldn't wait any longer. When he, when he had to know how they were doing. He sent Timothy. To find out. Now that's the mark of a true love for someone. You care genuinely about their spiritual well-being. Here's the second thing we see. He says, verse 1, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing, here it is, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. Not only do you have an intense interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people, you have a sacrificial interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people. A sacrificial interest. Not only do you care about them, but you are willing to be put out, as it were. You are willing to sacrifice yourself on, in some way, on some level. You're willing to undergo hardship yourself in order to take care of them. Paul is not just concerned about the Thessalonians. He is going to express this in a tangible way. He can't come to them himself but he so cares about how they're doing that he's going to take care of them in a way that's going to cost him personally. He says, we, he wants them to know this, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. 
I so care about you that I was willing to be left behind alone. All right? What's he talking about? Well, Luke doesn't mention this in the book of Acts, but when you look at Acts chapter 17, you can piece the picture together. You can read this in your own time. I'll just give you the picture tonight. Paul, Silas, Timothy have to leave Thessalonica, right? There's the uproar. They have to leave. Paul, Silas, and Timothy come to Berea, and it's not long before there's another uproar in Berea. Paul then has to leave Berea. They have to get him out of town there. But Timothy and Silas stay there. Acts chapter 17 verse 14. The Bible does tell us about that. Which means that Paul is transported to Athens and he arrives in Athens by himself. You can read about that in Acts 17. You remember he gets there, his spirit is stirred as he sees the idolatry and, and he goes about preaching and all of that. So he's by himself at Athens in the beginning. But he sends word that he wants Timothy and Silas to join him there. Well, the unreported part in, in Scripture, but we can put the picture together, is that... Timothy and Silas do actually join him in Athens. They arrive there. But Paul is so concerned about the Thessalonians that he decides to be left behind at Athens again. He decides, though he's, he, you know, he sends a word, I need these men here with me. But when they arrive, by the time they arrive, he is so worried about the Thessalonians that he decides to send Timothy <clears throat> to Thessalonica. He sends Silas to Macedonia. And so there he is at Athens alone again. And eventually he makes his way to Corinth, and there they, they join him. Paul says, even though I didn't want to be alone in Athens, I was so concerned about you, I was willing to be left there by myself. Listen, this is, from a practical point of view, this is sacrificial. Why do you think these men travel with Paul on these missionary journeys in the first place? Because you need help in ministry. You need help in ministry. I mean, he needs these men there with him. But he's willing to go, go it alone in order to find out how they are doing. See, he wants them to understand that. Not only is it a, a practical sacrifice, it's a personal sacrifice. Because one of the reasons you want help in ministry is friendship in ministry. Support, encouragement. We all need that in ministry. But Paul says, listen, I, I really love you. I care about, I cared about how you were doing. So I was willing, verse 1, willing to be left behind at Athens by myself. Now that's a true shepherd. Not only a real concern, but, but so real is your concern that you are willing to make it harder on yourself to make sure that the needs of the people you're ministering to get met. There's a third thing we see here. You see it in verse 2. He says, And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. By the way, quick side note, you, you, you get a picture, you get an insight there into what's troubling Paul about these people, right? He has to leave Thessalonica because there's been persecution. He has to leave Thessalonica because there's been, been hardship, adversaries. So as he leaves and he doesn't know how they're doing, what's concerning him is, have they been moved by the trouble? Has the trouble moved them away from the truth? That's what he's concerned about. So what does he decide to do? He can't go. He sends Timothy. Now that gets to the third point tonight. And that is when you really are a shepherd, when you really love someone, there's a, not only a real interest in their well-being and not only a sacrificial interest in their well-being, but third, there's a careful interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people. It's a careful interest. What do you mean, Richard? Well, just notice how he describes Timothy. He says, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. 
People have wondered, commentators have wondered, why does he describe Timothy in this way? Some have speculated, well, maybe he describes Timothy like this, because it's kind of an extended in- introduction. He doesn't just say, we sent Timothy, or I sent Timothy. He says, our brother, God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ. Some say, well, maybe it's because they didn't know Timothy that well. Some say, well, he was a young man, and maybe this is Paul's way of making sure they receive him and respect him. I think it's something even a little different from that. I think what Paul, remember what Paul's emphasizing. I, Paul, really do love you so that when I could not be there myself, I want you to understand I didn't just send you, I didn't send you just anyone. I care so much about you, if I could say it this way, I sent my best. I was willing to be left alone and I sent my best. I sent a brother, that speaks of affection. I sent someone who is a, this is a a very different way of uh, of describing someone, a co-worker of God. I sent you someone who works with God on behalf of your soul. He could have said a co-worker of ours. But he says, a co-worker of God. I sent you someone, God's at work in and through Timothy's life. So this isn't, you know, second-hand kind of ministry. This isn't the leftovers. if If he's just my co-worker, maybe you're getting the leftovers. But he's God's co-worker. So you're not suffering loss. I care about you, so I'm careful who I send. And you got my best. You know, I'm not just pulling this out of left field because Paul describes Timothy in these kinds of terms in other places, doesn't he? Philippians 2.19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus, this is what he writes to the Philippians, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. I don't have anyone that I'm so confident, like Timothy, that I'm so confident that when I send him to you, he's not concerned about himself. He's concerned about, he's concerned about the interests of Jesus. That's who I'm sending to you. 1 Corinthians 4.17, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Paul says to the Corinthians, I'm sending you my son in the faith. I'm sending you someone that when he goes, it's like I've come. He will remind you of my ways, Paul says, as I teach them in every church. Who does Paul follow? He follows Christ. Well, what does Timothy do? Timothy follows Paul and thus follows Christ. Here's someone, I I don't have anyone else who's more like myself in terms of love for Christ and love for you. That's what he's saying. What does it mean to really love your people? What does it mean to really have a shepherd's heart? Not only do you have a genuine interest in their spiritual well-being, not only do you have a sacrificial interest in their spiritual well-being, but you have a careful interest in their spiritual well-being. You don't just expose them uh, to, to just anyone. There's a careful interest in terms of who informs them. It's important who informs them. It's one of the reasons why, and we're obviously not perfect in it, but we long to be faithful in it. You know, who stands in this pulpit is important. Who stands here to preach is important. Who informs you is important. And what informs you is important. 
because he is this brother and he is this co-worker of God in the gospel of Christ. You see, Timothy is a minister of the gospel of Christ. He's going to come to them with the truth of Jesus. That's what they need. This leads to a fourth mark of a genuine shepherd. You see it at the end of verse 2. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. Fourth mark of a true shepherd's true love is a strategic interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people. That is, genuine care for souls is expressed in a biblical understanding of the need of people. To really care about people is not for you and I to brainstorm over what we think they need. To really care about someone is to believe God about what they need and to be committed to what God has revealed about what his people need. What was Paul concerned about? What is he sending Timothy to do? Listen, he's not just sending Timothy to do some kind of genuine I'm, I'm sorry, some kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Generic, general kind of thing. He sends Timothy to do something very spe uh, specific. He says, verse 2, to establish. That is, he wants, and this was a word that was used um, of establishing young believers in the faith. We want to be sure that you're established in the faith, that, that your foundations are strong. You know, we're there, we share the gospel, people are saved, church comes into existence, we have to leave the city. Now, I want to send Timothy back and make sure that you are on a firm foundation. I want to make sure you're established in the faith. And I send Timothy to you, next statement, to exhort you in your faith. You don't just need to know what to believe. You need to be encouraged to believe it. You need to be encouraged to walk in it. You need to be challenged to walk in it. Folks, ministry is not just imparting information. It's also coming to the people of God and saying, listen, we've got to walk in this. It's not enough to know it. We have to do it. Let's don't just be hearers of the word. Let's be doers of the word. So you teach people. You exhort people. And something else you do is you fortify them. He says that no one may be moved. Interesting word there, moved. It was used of, at times of a dog wagging its tail. If you ever have a dog that really is a wagger, all right, you know what that looks like, moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he says, we don't want you like that in the spiritual realm. We don't want you moving back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We want to teach you. We want to encourage you. And we don't want you to be moved around by these afflictions. We want you to be solid. We want you to be able to stand your ground and to stay in place. That no one may be moved by these troubles, by these afflictions. I mean, Paul has a plan, doesn't he? Timothy has an assignment. Do we have a plan in ministry? This is a mark of true love, as I said. Not that you and I are trying to come up with what we think our people need. But we believe God because God has revealed what his people need. So we're committed to God's plan for his people. And that involves teaching the truth and exhorting people to walk in the truth and helping them be stable in the truth. If you read Ephesians 4 and you read about the role of the teachers in the church, so the, the children of God would not be like waves tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. 
Not like children always confused. Knowing what they believe, why they believe it, being exhorted to walk in it so that when trouble comes, they are not moved back and forth. That's love. Which gets to the fifth thing, the fifth mark of true shepherding. Genuine interest in the well-being of God's people, sacrificial interest in the well-being of God's people, a careful interest in the well-being of God's people, who you send to them, who you expose them to, a strategic interest in the well-being of God's people, establish them in the faith, encourage them in the faith, stabilize them in the faith. Here's a, a fifth thing you see, a realistic interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people. Why is he sending Timothy to do this? Verse 3, so that no one may be moved by these afflictions. You mean that's possible? It's possible for God's people to be troubled by troubles? He says, notice this, this is not something new for Paul. He says, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. Why? For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. What do we mean by a realistic interest in the spiritual well-being of God's people? We mean that when you really love people, when you really love God's people, you do not underestimate the dangers that threaten them. When you really love God's people, you recognize they have an enemy. I mean, you have an enemy, but as a shepherd, you recognize they have an enemy. What's Paul concerned about? Verse 5, he says, for fear that somehow the, what does he say? The tempter, who's that? Satan. Listen, I'm not ignorant, Paul says. Satan is out to do you harm as the Lord's church, as God's people. You face a tempter. He's not naive to that. He's not blind to that. He doesn't underestimate that. And he recognizes that even apostasy happens. What does he mean when he says, lest our labor would be in vain? He means, I mean... Perhaps even the possibility they could be moved away from the faith altogether. Now, no one has to tell us that Paul completely understood the sovereignty of God and salvation and the security of the believer and all the rest. But he also understands the reality of apostasy and that God works through means to keep his people in the faith. So he's not going to underestimate the, the seriousness of what they're going through. They are in the midst of persecution, affliction, and it's dangerous to them. So you have to have a realistic view of what God's people are facing. A real enemy, real troubles, and real possible dangers. So if you have this realistic view of what the people of God are facing, what do you do if you love them? You prepare them for it. Not only is he sending Timothy to them right now to help them be established, but Paul's able to reflect back on when he was with them, and he's able to tell them, I warned you about this. Folks, do you realize it is loving to warn God's people of what might move them out of the way of truth? It's amazing. We're living in a time where everyone wants everything to always stay positive, right? Tell me something positive. Isn't it interesting? You go, you go, you go to um, Acts 20. When Paul is leaving the Ephesian elders, he's seeing them for the last time. And he tells them there how he had warned them night and day with tears about the fact that when he left, there are going to be wolves that come in among them. I mean, what is Paul doing? This is the pattern you see in the New Testament when it comes to new believers. It's amazing, isn't it, that in many cases in, in our churches, we have new believers and we're leaving them with the impression, you've come to Jesus, now everything is going to be wonderful. Paul's approach was just the opposite. You've come to Jesus, now get ready. Everything's going to get tough. 
I mean, you're going to face affliction. You're going to face persecution. You're going to face things that come against you that want to move you out of the way of truth. And he says, I warned you about this night and day in Acts chapter 20. And here in our, in our text tonight, he says, verse 4, when we were with you, we kept telling you. We kept telling you. I mean, I didn't just tell you. I kept telling you before it happened that we were to suffer affliction. Paul, how can you, how can you tell people that you know they're going to suffer affliction? Let me just ask you tonight, would I be accurate as a pastor, would I be accurate to tell this church that you better get ready for it, you're going to face affliction? Would that be a wise thing for me to do? Can you be sure that you're going to face affliction? Well, look back up at what he says in verse 3. He says, for you yourselves know that we are, what? Destined for this. It has been granted to us, not just to believe on the Lord Jesus, but to suffer with him. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, next word, shall or will, what? Suffer persecution. Is it a maybe that you, Christian, will face affliction? Is that a maybe or is it a certainty? If you live the Christian life, I mean, if you live the Christian life, it's a certainty, isn't it? And folks, I'll tell you right now, if, if our nation was in the healthiest condition it could possibly be in, you're still going to suffer for living the genuine Christian life. But, and, and this is an exciting thing, I think, for us, because the light shines brightest in darkness. But right now, we're not in a healthy condition. We're not. I didn't get to read the whole story, but before I left here, I saw online a story about um, a law being passed. I think it was in Memphis, uh, outlawing discrimination against homosexuals. And it's going to affect hiring practices. You know, I'm no prophet, don't claim to be, but you can just see the handwriting on the wall. It's going to become more and more difficult in this nation if we keep heading the direction we're heading to speak the truth of God's word about homosexuality. It's going to become more difficult. And it may, there may come a day we have to suffer, not, not for being hateful, for, but for simply speaking the truth of God's word. Now, are you ready for that? Not are you going to run out and seek it. <laughs> but when it comes, will you be faithful? Are you prepared to be faithful? You see, his interest in these people, it's not like Pollyanna. It's a realistic concern. He knows, he knows what these people are facing. So what does he do? He takes real steps of action. He did when he was with them, and now he's doing it when he can't be with them. He's taking real steps of action to prepare them beforehand for what they're going to face. When you love people, you prepare them with the truth. You prepare them. I was driving downtown this morning and my wife texted me uh, something that blessed me. I want you to look over to Second Peter chapter 1. But she, uh, she texted me a, a reminder. She had read something this morning in her devotion. And she texted me and she said that when John MacArthur had been at Grace Community Church for 10 years, I think this is, this is interesting since our young people are headed to camp and John MacArthur is going to be there. But when he had been at Grace Community Church for 10 years, he took a three-month sabbatical. And he wasn't sure he was going to go back. Because he felt like he had taught them, perhaps he had taught them everything he knew. I, I can identify with that feeling. For, you know, he's been there 40 years now, so obviously he returned. But when he came back, he came back with 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 to verse 15. 
Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them, and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of what? Reminder. Folks, do you realize most of our ministry, after we've taught people well, after we've spent years in ministry someplace, most of our ministry is going to be a ministry of reminder. Oh, there will always be new believers and people who've not heard the things that you've heard. But for some of you, you know, you've been here, I've been here 12 years. You, you've heard me preach on all these subjects from different parts of God's word multiple times. But you know what? And here's what you've got to be convinced of. You still need to hear it. I still need to say it and you still need to hear it. Why? Verse 14, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. Why do we need to hear the truth again and again and again and again? Because we have a tendency to forget it. And we need to remember it. So that wherever we are, in whatever situation, the truth is in our thinking. Now, let me ask us tonight, do we love people by this standard? We say we love people. Do we have a, a genuine concern about how they're doing spiritually? Do we have enough concern that we're willing to sacrifice personally to help them do well spiritually? Do we care enough about them that we have a careful approach about helping them walk in the truth and a strategic approach about helping them walk in the truth? Are we committed to teaching, exhorting, and stabilizing? And do we have a realistic view of what they're facing so that we're concerned in a serious way? That's love. Do we prepare people for what the Christian life really is? Do we tell people that the Christian life means that we're going to enter the kingdom through many troubles? Do we teach people that? Do we teach people that they are destined for affliction? And that it is so important that they be saturated with the truth and committed to the truth from their heart, which is to say committed to the God who gave us the truth. Do we teach people they must be committed to the truth because the day will come they will have to suffer for it? I think about this as a parent. There's a sense in which I am glad that my children get to grow up in a home where they feel safe and things are taken care of and they know that I believe the truth and their mother believes the truth and we've taught them to believe the truth and all that's wonderful. But the day is coming, perhaps, whenever that day is, if we all live and if the Lord Jesus tarries, the day will come when they're out on their own or we're not here. Are we preparing them to, if need be, suffer for Christ? Because if we keep heading the way we're heading, it's going to become more and more difficult in this culture to live the truth. How do we prepare them? How do you prepare people to live the truth even in a world that's hostile to the truth? You prepare them by teaching them, exhorting them, and stabilizing them. You you prepare them by telling them beforehand, reminding them again and again and again so that if one day you're not there, they will easily be able to call it to mind. May each of us, wherever we have a shepherding responsibility, be real shepherds. All God's people would say, let's pray together.
Father in heaven, we thank you for the precious treasure that you have deposited with us in your word. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus. We thank you that we're forgiven and that we're safe always in your hand. We thank you for your spirit who lives in us and who leads us and guides us into the truth and who is our, not only our comforter, but he's the one who strengthens us that we might be able to stand firm in the whole armor of God that you've supplied for us, Lord, even in the evil day. Help us to be faithful as a church, not just to teach, but to remind. And to continue reminding and to continue reminding because, Lord, we are so prone to forget. I pray also, Lord, that we would examine our love for you in terms of sacrifice. Father, it grieves me to see what little commitment is so often present in professing believers. Lord, I pray that we would examine whether we know what sacrificial love for you even is. And that wherever we have opportunity, we would strive to be faithful even to the point of sacrifice. Lord, bless your church here. Help us to be faithful to you in every way. Strengthen us, Lord, to glorify your name. And help us, Lord, not just to do that in, in a corporate sense, but where it begins, Lord, as individuals and in our families. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We will be dismissed with song. <laughs>